College Management at uh, Equans, part of NG Group. And Rhea will be talking about her experiences of implementing a knowledge base or knowledge management platform and how the knowledge team there helped to create a culture of learning and sharing. We've already covered that a couple of times. So welcome, uh, Rhea. Thanks uh, for joining us today. It's great to have you with us. Hi, David. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Hi to oh, everybody it's, it's else at SDI. Ah, it's a pleasure. Absolutely. You, you, your, your screen looks fantastic. You sound great as well. So over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so I'll just make sure everything's working now that it looks good. <laughs> OK, so as David said, I am the assistant knowledge manager here at Equans. Um, Equans was formerly known as NG, a low carbon energy and services company that's recently created a new client solutions entity. So as of July 1st, we were rebranded as Equans, um, an autonomous business, but still part of the NG group. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. I, I, I won't harp on any of that. Uh, but in regards to the Fiona Flowers Knowledge Management Award, I will be showing you uh, uh, a screenshot of the capabilities that allowed us to win that award uh, further down in the presentation. So what is knowledge management to me? Um, it's a cyclical and collaborative process between you, the, the knowledge team or the knowledge source and the business, so the community you serve, your customers. Um, I'll use the, the term tool and platform possibly interchangeably today. Um, so your tool is the physical application that you use to transfer the knowledge to your customer base, that you educate them on and hopefully they become empowered to use and self-serve going forward. And that's then supported by knowledge sharing behaviours. So that would be the webinar or the presentation which you use to demonstrate your tool and then following up with training sessions provided to that community, that customer base to enable them to use the tool to the best of their ability. And that often leads to complementary processes. Um, for example, an information request service, which I will tell you about later in the, the presentation, but stuff that supports the tool and helps you then to facilitate building that community um, around knowledge and content and foster a culture of collaboration, learning and sharing. Um, so once your tool and your behaviours are embedded, the community are familiar with using your tool and um, they're able to feed back to you. And that could be on the content, the knowledge within that tool or the user experience, which would then lead to you improving and enhancing your tool um, and any additional features created then you will reintroduce those and thus uh, you get your cycle. So when you are introducing this new learning tool to a new audience, these are the kind of questions that you will need to think about when you're developing it, um, because the answers will drive the, the structural output of what you're creating. Um, and be the basis to which you refer back to during the process to ensure you are meeting requirements. So, so what were you tasked with? What is the purpose of creating this tool? Why, why is it needed? Um, and, and how are you going to deliver this thing? What tech, what software is available for you to use? Is it accessible to everybody? You know, are, are licenses required and thus a cost? Is there something that already exists that you can tweak, that you can make fit for purpose as opposed to starting from scratch? Um, you will potentially have a challenge introducing this new tool. It's a, it's a new way of working for people. So you want to make that as easy as possible by um, making that transition familiar. So using familiar terms, language, indexing, imagery that your, your customer base, your community can relate to. And you want to include them in the conversation at the very beginning. What is it that they want? So you were tasked with something and the why, but how, how are they um, envisioning using this thing? Uh, what features can you build in at, at the, that first stage that can help them to, to do what it is they need to do with this tool also, not just the content that's within it? So your what do they want will inform the how um, of your creation. And is this tool serving more than one purpose? Um, 
Is it going to be used by separate areas of your business? Is it going to be used uh, by different audiences? So do you need separate areas or do you need uh, different permission groups to manage that? And once they're using that tool, you want them to essentially get to a point of being able to self-serve in order to find the information they need to do to inform their work. So just to put that into context for us at Equans, um, the knowledge department um, is a, it's a central resource um, and we were tasked with storing collateral that's used in the creation of bids and proposals. So that's the what and the why was because it needed to be accessed easily by different business development teams across the whole UK BU. So that's across divisions that may all work um, slightly differently to the other. And the how for us was by using SharePoint. So that's software that's uh, rolled out already within the business. And luckily, we already had the skill set within the team to, to create and build from that software. So this is an example of our learning tool, which, which is called the Knowledge Hub, um, as I say, built on SharePoint. And these are some of the areas um, within that Knowledge Hub. Um, and just to, to follow up on the point about possibly having different audiences or customers, the business development oversight area is, is locked to those uh, who work in business development. And that's managed by setting up different permission levels. So if somebody tries to click into there and access that space, um, us in the knowledge team will get a notification because it will send an access request through to us. If you're familiar with SharePoint, which I assume you are, um, it will send an access request through to us uh, for us to either approve or reject based on where that person is working in the business. So the next couple of slides that I'm going to show you are screenshots from within our tool, just in regards to how we stored the content uh, we use metadata um, in, in hopes that it allows customers to intuitively find information. So, excuse me, um, documents uploaded all have a title, um, the content type uh, attributed to the business function they belong to. They are tagged with different topics uh, relative to the subject matter of that document. Everything has a document owner, um, a subject matter expert, you can see the date it was published and the annual review frequency that's assigned will drive the last review and next review dates. So that was the full library. Um, this is an example of a, um, a case studies library that we have where case studies have been uploaded and part of that metadata that's asked is which division it belongs to and subdivision. So you're able to then display that information by division. Um, to allow your customers to find information that way. And they just drill down until they get to the document that sits within their, their desired area. You can see here on the left that we've got different ways of breaking down um, that library, which can be seen in, in, in its entirety as shown on the previous screenshot or broken down by these things here. And, and one possibly I'd say key aspect for us that's, that's proven very beneficial is our key topics list. Um, so we've got rough, well, I say roughly, I think it's more than 200 key topics in there now. Um, that, that was a number we did try to keep down, but um, I guess as the business grows and develops, there, there are more areas that, that, that come up that need to be added to this list. So down the left, you have all your key topics. So these are some of the things you would have seen in the first screenshot that were tagged or attributed to that particular document. And it's, it is plotted against the different content types or the most popular content types that we have. So um, a customer, if you know what it is that you're looking for, the probably the quickest way for you to find it is to go straight to your key topic search and look for your key topics. So if I wanted information on apprentices and graduates, uh, I can see that we've got one, two, three, four different content types on that topic. And if I click into that hyperlink, it will uh, provide a list or a library view, similar to what you saw in the first screenshot of all those documents that are attributed to that particular topic. So 
in order to create that community around knowledge and, and foster the culture of collaboration and sharing, you'll need to embed some knowledge sharing behaviours and, and they are, are typically driven by the knowledge team. You need to ensure that your, your tool doesn't become a dumping ground or an archive, for want of a better phrase. And you do that by, you know, regular maintenance of the system, but more importantly, uh, regular reviews of that content. So as you saw with the metadata, there's a document owner, that person is responsible for reviewing the document, an annual review frequency is set. Um, so you'll see, you saw that there's an next review date is due. And that's basically because we want there to be an element of integrity with regards to our system and the, the content that you access through it. Um, you essentially want one version of the truth that is centrally accessed. So your customers are giving out the same message and that is a, a benefit of using something like SharePoint where you have that version control. You know, you want uh, confidence that any customer that's accessing something, they are accessing the most accurate and up-to-date information. Um, you need to develop, uh, uh, I call a Rolodex of subject matter experts, not just to tag to content or attribute to a piece of content, but to signpost people to if they're unable to find what they're looking for within your knowledge tool. You um, can benefit from having knowledge champions, so <clears throat> different uh, people dotted around different areas of the business who are supporting what you are trying to achieve. They know how to use your tool. They're able to um, show others how to use the tool and provide feedback from their different areas in order for you to enhance your tool. You want to maintain regular content and, uh, sorry, contact. And obviously lockdown has uh, um, affected that. But if you're in a position where you can get up and speak to somebody as opposed to send an email, um, make yourself visible, make that knowledge team known. Um, and when you update your, your tool and um, put new content on there, how do you update your customers? So for us, we, we use Yammer sometimes and we'll, we'll, we've got different Yammer groups that you can post to and you can put a link to the content that you're making them aware of. So they're taken directly to your tool and once they're there, they, can, they have the option of obviously exploring and having a look around. Um, again, identifying gaps. So those regular users that you have, uh, they're, they're great, uh, proactive most likely and able to uh, tell you what's missing or what's changing so they become little knowledge experts of themselves and um, you need buy-in so you want that buy-in not just from those who you were tasked with creating this tool from but everybody who's assisted to date um, so you're at a point now where people should be seeing the benefits of using this tool um, it should become part of their their, their daily use if you like um, in order to facilitate what it is that they're doing. Um, that last point there, managing the information request service, as I mentioned uh, earlier briefly, this is an example of what I would call a complementary process that supports our tool. So if you come to the Knowledge Hub because um, you need some information, but you can't find what you're looking for, that, that, you know, there's buttons around where you can click on um, and this information request service essentially opens up an email where you put your query in, you send that email, the knowledge team receive it and they will fulfill that request for you. That's also a red flag for us that there's there's a content gap in our in our knowledge hub. Um, and if we can't fulfill that request, we will at the very least put you in contact with the right individual. So that goes back to your development of your network of subject matter experts. Likewise, if you have information that you feel your colleagues will benefit from, you can submit that content to us. We'll make sure it's reviewed and put in the right format or template. We'll attach a document owner and subject matter expert, and then that will become available for use by your colleagues. So all, all of these little things go to fostering that, that culture of learning and sharing and collaboration. You know, so, you know, you're fostering that community, you need support, um, you need buy-in, you have typically, I, I think it's possibly in most businesses, you know, there there's the certain individuals that are just that fun, fountain of knowledge uh, and it's just, it's all up there. So people are continuously going to them to, to get that knowledge. You need to extract that knowledge out of their heads and put it into the system. Um, that's more content for you. The SME can then direct 
traffic to your tool. So it's an increase in traffic for you, there's additional content for you, and, and I guess the biggest benefit for that SME is them getting their time back to focus on other things. Um, so your stakeholders, your SMEs, they'll start to talk about your platform. If you can highlight the benefits of those users, you're more likely to get people to talk about it. They tell their colleagues, and well, actually, that would be quite beneficial to me. I can write something up, I can upload that. And again, that buys for them back some time. Knowledge forums, that was an initiative of ours, um, again, to foster collaboration. So it, it's a monthly meet uh, whereby we have open dialogue. Um, we have key presenters from different areas of the business come and talk about their expertise or their area. Depending on the topic, you, you know, different people will want to turn up so that can drive up your attendees. They speak to colleagues who in turn then want to come and present their area or their expertise. So this is now widening your network and, and you know, broadening your community and you're imparting more knowledge, you're getting more content to create. Content creation as, as I say, filling in the gaps, you know, if you've, you've got that iterative process between you and your customers of feedback, um, you know, stay on top of business updates. It's, uh, it can become, or for us, the Knowledge Hub has become that, that place that people can go to um, to find stuff out. We've got uh, what's latest or what's happening um, on the homepage. So that's where the business updates will be. And you can click through to links that take you to other um, tools or software or sites that the business um, has. Trust your colleagues to, to assist. It's not um, solely the responsibility of the knowledge team to create this content. The content or your system is only ever going to be as good as the content and um, you have plenty of untapped sources of content. So is it something that can add into your yearly objectives? Uh, going forward, um, each member of staff has to submit two pieces of content a year to the to the Knowledge Hub, or can you incentivize them maybe uh, to contribute content to your Knowledge Hub? Your Knowledge Team, you uh, are best place having an open door policy. Um, you know, lend a hand outside of your remit, basically get involved in projects uh, around the business, not just for you to gain transferable skills, but it's again, it's that knowledge gain, it's that visibility, um, people seeing and knowing who you are and understanding um, you have an opportunity to then talk about your tool as well as help them out. Um, again, depending on the software that you use, um, you can mentor somebody to create a tool similar or maybe has the same kind of structure but for a different end for a different purpose because your tool while it is what it is is also an example of what can be created and we found that um, a lot of people or should I say a lot of colleagues have come and asked how they can build something sim similar or maybe take just an element of what we have created for them to do the same thing within their team so that's again increasing the visibility and promoting the department. Your end goal really is to create a community of knowledge managers um, and culture sharing. So you want to embed these knowledge managers uh, around the, the business and get people into this self-serving um, way of behaving, which ultimately will lead to proactivity as well. Um, so for us, the knowledge team is, is like the glue that holds everybody together. So we work with the contracts, the subject matter experts and the business functions to create that content. Um, they utilize our, our knowledge forum to present and update our audience on, on different things happening in the business. And obviously we then serve the customers. So enhancing and improving your tool is essentially anything that you've done outside of your initial brief um, when you first set it up. So your tool's been created, it's introduced, you've, you have created this community, you're fostering that culture um, and embedded these, this new way of working. Um, and this will have incited some conversation um, about what people are experiencing with your tool, um, which would then lead to new ideas, pilot in new and additional features. Maybe you can engage your customers uh, to, to, to do some user acceptance testing or maybe your, your knowledge champions, um, get them to try things before you release things so you can improve them. 
um, and essentially it's almost like a supply and demand running in the background type of thing. People need this if you're able to meet that within the requirements of your, your tech and your software, um, then you roll that out. You want to keep your, your customers happy at the end of the day. Um, and this obviously just leads back into your cyclical process of introducing the new tool. And then you have to educate people on your new tool. You need to train them on your new tool. So the capabilities site is um, an example of one of our enhancements. And this, as I uh, previously mentioned, was what we won the Fiona Flowers Awards for. Um, we were at a point where there wasn't anywhere that anybody could go to to find out what the, the business does uh, overall. What, what do we do in the UK? So the, we created these searchable, indexable and scalable maps of the services and activities and subject matter experts in the UK. So each of these um, on the outside um, and then this ring as well, they're all clickable. They're all documents that, that provide a high level and easily digestible overview of, of that particular service. Um, and the reason we did that was to inform operational staff so that could aid um, with them upselling. Um, another benefit of this was for those within business development who are creating and tailoring service offerings and also to educate new starters. You could, um, there were actually three wheels because there was a services wheel, which you're seeing now, um, an energy wheel and a regeneration wheel. Those are the three business activities of ours. Um, so if you had new starters, they could just spend some time perusing the site and getting an idea of what it is that we do. Um, and it's also a more visually engaging way of displaying content and information. I feel like I've, I've spoken really, really fast. So I do apologize. Um, the key takeaways, you know, is understanding the purpose of that tool. What were you tasked with? Why are you doing it? And how are you going to do it? How are your, the needs and expectations of your customers going to be balanced with your system and the functionality? Um, how accessible it is? You need to, you know, minimize your hurdles and, and keep it engaging. You want to promote those knowledge sharing behaviors, which which would essentially are anything that supports your your tool and promotes your tool. Um, build that community, make, you know, sharing knowledge the, the, the prime uh, task within that, that community so you can foster that culture of learning and sharing. Um, because as I say, that the tool will only ever be as good as what you put in it. You know, there, and there will always be demand for new tools and additional features. So you need to keep adapting uh, to your customer. Try and think outside the box because your tool is never essentially finished. It will continue to evolve as you adapt to the changing needs of your customer. So that's it from me. Thank you, David. Awesome. That's great, Ria. Thank you very much indeed. No, no, not at all. You didn't rush through that. Actually, we, we're a couple of minutes sort of over, but I think that's OK. That's OK. <laughs> Um, so that, no, that was really cool. I mean, to, to give a, a real in-depth, um, you know, uh, visual sort of uh, visual way of communicating what you've been doing there is, is fantastic. We are in break, right? We've just gone into break and this is for everybody. So if you want to go away now, just grab a, um, a quick coffee and a tea. We're going to resume at um, half past 12. All right. In the meantime, though, I am going to ask you a question if that's uh, OK. Ria. <laughs> so anybody wants to just go and grab a tea, please do. Um, and we'll we'll sort of come back at, uh, at half past. Um, there, there were a few questions coming through, and I think one or two of them, I mean, I've got a few myself, actually, but one or two of them um, uh, were related to um, the value of, of what you do, how you realize that. So maybe measurements, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and stuff like that. But also about um, that cultural thing about gaining, this is from Barbara, gaining the buy-in from SMEs. So in that last um, slide, last but one slide, you had the, the SME there as an important stakeholder. How, how, yeah, how do you, the one before that, I think, was that maybe... Uh, maybe it's the very, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one. So how do you, how do you, how do you engage with the, the SME personnel? How do you make them responsible or how do they get buy-in? Because, you know, I, I think certainly my experience is usually the SME is out doing stuff. And the last thing they want to do is spend some time with somebody else to tell somebody else how they do and what they do. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because there's a fear factor there. There's yeah, so it is very much a cultural thing, isn't it? So how how do you engage with those people and keep them them sort of close to you? I suppose. 
I think it's selling the benefit. Um, uh, pre, you know, different roles that I've worked in within the bidding department, you know, everybody has stuff to do. Uh, you've got a deadline, but the, the people that you need the information from are the doing, they're operational. And if you can just catch them on one day and make it easy by saying, you know, I will sit with you and you tell me the questions that you're most asked and just talk and I will create that content based on what you're saying to me. So you could create a, an FAQ document or something that we have in our system is called a standard response document. So the response doesn't change irrespective of which division is, um, is, is utilizing that information. So again, I'm talking from a BD perspective, but I am um, aware that you know it's broader than that. But you know, if you're responding to a question in a, in a tender, depending on that question, it, the answer is not going to change. So the benefit is what you need to highlight to the SME. You send everybody who comes to you, you direct them to the hub because you've answered it, as opposed to keep going, uh, answering the question over and over and again, in different slight variations, depending on how the question's being asked, the content is exactly the same. And then you attach a document owner. So while the subject matter expert may be attached to that piece of content, they're not the ones that are going to be, not, I shouldn't say going to be bothered by, but they're not the ones mm. responsible for physically doing the review of that document. It's yeah. the document owner's job to do that. So they will likely work within their team. So they will have some knowledge and they will at least be able to see, well, this is still accurate. This is still up to date. This mm. is still the way things work. Um, I think it's always about selling the benefit because it is a benefit to other people. We are making other people's lives easy by essentially storing information that people can access from wherever and mm. saving you keep reinventing the wheel. Yeah, absolutely. And if thank you for that. And if we come onto the slide with the um, with the three level sort of round, what do you call that? The capabilities model, I think, isn't it? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've, uh, certainly people are very interested in this. Um, I think one person, I think Michael said, I can't see the outside bit. So just explain maybe how that works. You've got the, the inner bit and obviously these are clickable, uh, clickable and you know, you can mm -hmm. go through on them. The stuff on the very outside, are the, are the, did you say that those are individual SMEs or, or SME areas? Individual services or activities. So um, the, the, what we do as a business broken down by um, our free business activities. This is the services one. So this is services. These are the areas that all of these tasks fall into. And mm. if you click on these, it will open up a Word document that gives you the, the what, the how, and the why of this particular capability of ours of what we're doing. Yeah, and it cool. will also provide you with an SME and their contact details for further information. So that does away then, does that do away to some degree with the search capability? So would you just hone in, we talked in the last one with Hannah about sort of context. If you can see the context of what you're trying to do, you can click on it, you straight to the document, one click rather than searching for it. Is that right? Yes, there is a search function, but it's 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 like a SharePoint search. I think it works yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah. Google. So if you put something in it, the, 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 a search term, the thing that comes up first is, is the document that has that search term in it yeah. the most. So yeah. it's not the most accurate, which is why we have that key topic yeah. search. So if you so know what it is you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. Two ways to access it. Good. Last question. We've got two minutes <laughs> before everybody comes back from, 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 from break, right? I'm really interested in, in, I've got a few more questions about usage because I think usage, people engaging with it to create stuff um, mm -hmm. and how it's used is so important. I think we've always been challenged with how do you, how do you, you know, how do you sort of, make not make wrong word um entice people to use this stuff you know it, it, just give us an idea on on the number of articles that you guys manage right so how many articles do you add how many articles do you update and and how many articles may maybe do you retire on a monthly basis i don't know if you've got that or an idea of it just to give us an idea of the scale um okay at the end of last year we did a quiz <laughs> and it was within our knowledge forum and one of the question was, uh, how many pieces of content do you think the Knowledge Hub has? And I'd like to think I'm accurate in saying it was about 1300 at that time. Wow. Um, yeah, cool. So we do reviews on a monthly basis. The first Monday of the month, we send out expired content reviews. So for the documents where you see uh, on one of the screenshots, the, um, the next review date is coming up. So there is a way of, um, you know, in SharePoint, you can extract 
data and then mm. you just filter it so that the, the the dates that have passed you will then email all of the owners for this particular piece of content and you say you know your review dates come uh, can you please say whether this needs to stay and you increase um, just add another cycle for review another frequency um, it's old you can take it off or it needs updating I'll update it and send you a new one um, when it comes to retiring content it, that's a tricky one and, and, and between me and, and James Heritage, my line manager, the, the knowledge manager, we uh, we kind of go back and forth on it because a hard and fast rule could say if it's older than two years, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But it really does depend on what that content is. So um, again, for those in BD, you want examples of where we have done something before. It doesn't necessarily matter how old it is. The fact is we've done that before, which means we can do it again. So mm. in terms of case studies, they may stay on slightly longer than maybe a functional piece of content would. Good. That's superb. Thank you very much. I think there's a, an awful lot of interest in, in the logic that you've put into, that you guys have put into um, the, the that, that model, the capabilities model. A lot of people are very interested in that. I think it's really good as well, actually. Um, Dave has asked, what, what did you create it with? And, and that's a good question. It, was there any specific tool or is that an image? which drives sort of, you know, I don't know. Oh, Do you know what I mean, Tia? Yeah. About the capabilities. The capabilities. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So is that, um, that wheel is an image and it is actually yeah. a, um, not the easiest to update because it's a, a flat image. You, in, you use a PDF and then you have to like draw boxes around yeah. each one to then hyperlink the box and then you put that into your SharePoint site so that when people click on it it takes you to the hyperlink of the document that's already yeah. been uploaded in the library. That's so great. It, it's a bit cumbersome um, and we are in the process of updating that particular area to yeah. make it a lot less cumbersome but we, you know, you were going for visually engaging and Absolutely. trying to display a different way that you can house information on a site. Yeah. Brilliant. Ria, thank you very much. And thanks for staying on as well. And, and um, we, we're literally into, into Hank's time now. So we're going to we're going to draw a close to that. Thank you very much indeed. And, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do this again at some point. So thank you very much indeed. That'd be great. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. You too. Take care. Take care.